So today we're going to be talking about humor and uh, why we laugh and why we find things funny. So in order to talk about humor, first we need to talk about laughter. So really, when you think of laughter, you think of uh, laughing at a joke or just laughing with your friends and stuff. So laughter is a physical response to humor, but it's not necessarily humor. It can be the physical response, but a majority of the time, it's just a response. Um, if you've ever watched a comedy by yourself, you probably noticed that although you do find the jokes funny, you weren't laughing. You might have smiled, you might have even uh, blown some air through your nose, like a little <laughs> But you didn't <laughs> laugh. But if you were to watch that same movie with the group of your best friends, you would probably all be laughing. So instead of it being an expression of humor, it's really an expression of social aspect and a form of yourself. It, it allows for an ease of tension. Everyone's very relaxed afterwards. Um, so we do laugh at a lot of different things. You can laugh at uh, just a joke. Why did the chicken cross the road? You could laugh at someone falling down. You could laugh at uh, something really dark. So different, different things. But true laughter that comes from humor is unconscious. It's not a physical and conscious state that you choose to laugh at. It's something that just occurs. So that raises the question, what is humor? So today when I will be talking about laughter, I'm talking about laughter in response to humor, and really just humor as a whole. So humor is anything that causes amusement, more of mental amusement. Uh, you wouldn't call a roller coaster humor, although you might be amused. It, it does not necessarily cause laughter. I'm sure you've all heard plenty of puns, and while that's a form of humor, it's not something you would necessarily laugh at. So some classic examples of humor is uh, puns, jokes, irony, so different things. So there's five main theories that either were the, the main theory or is the main theory today. So these theories are the play theory, the benign violation theory, the relief theory, the superiority theory, and the incongruity theory. So the play theory sees humor as an extension of the act of play. In it, it was developed in 1936 by Max Eastman in his novel, The Enjoyment of Laughter. And one of the main things that people trying to figure out humor is, is they have to describe tickling. Because tickling is something that both invokes laughter and is a form of humor, yet is also not a form of humor in the sense that it's not mental, though it's physical. So it's a very gray line that they still aren't entirely sure of, and it's still commonly debated today. So this theory saw humor as a, a social aspect, and it's just a natural stage that everyone goes through during, like they do in play, to become a mature adult. So all sorts of animals, uh, you've probably seen dogs and cubs playing, we all play, and it's just a connection to that form of play that we use. So some pros and cons is, although it explains jokes really well, or not jokes, it explains tickling and general laughter, why we laugh, it doesn't explain humor. It explains the social aspect of laughing, but it doesn't explain why a joke or a pun or uh, just witty humor is funny. So for that reason, this theory was kind of dropped. So the benign violation theory is a theory that sees humor as an escape from the social norms that we have today. So it was created by Thomas Bach in the early 1900s, and it shows humor as taking both a harmless form of violation, a harmless violation of social norms, but <coughs> also, yeah, harmless. So it has to be both, no, no one can get hurt from this. So if you've ever seen people fall, it's funny. You laugh at someone falling, and you, you consider that humorous. But as soon as that this accident or fall starts to become more serious, it starts to lose its humor. That's because this theory states that it has to be both benign and a violation. This theory also explains why uh, potty language or potty talk is funny, because it's it's a violation of the social humor. You wouldn't necessarily talk about that, 
but it violates that, and it's harmless, so we laugh. So why is this? What does this work with? This shows accidents. It shows toilet jokes. It explains tickling, in a sense, because you wouldn't regularly go up and tuck someone around the rib cage, but in the sense of tickling, you are. You're doing that, and that invokes humor, in a sense. So it works with that, but it doesn't explain puns, punchline jokes, or really other witty humor. So the third theory is the relief theory. So this theory shows humor as a means to grant relief to a person. It was created in 1860 by Herbert Spencer and Sigmund Freud. And Sigmund Freud really elaborated this in his book, Physiology of Laughter. So like the Greeks did with tragedies, where people would go and watch tragedies and allow their emotions and all the angst that they had been building up in their lives to release, watching someone else go through uh, trauma and drama, the Humor and the laughter evoked by this theory shows that we have a lot of stress and tension and just problems in our lives, and that when we laugh and we find something funny, it's our brain just kind of releasing all of that energy and tension. And this is really proven or er, supported by the way that we feel after laughing. After laughing with a bunch of people, you probably feel very relaxed. You are, are very open and you feel just kind of a sense of renewal. And this, this shows that with it, you can, you're releasing all this energy and all of this uh, just negativity that becomes humor and laughter. So this explains tickling, uh, again, in, in that it's, it's a buildup of energy and then it's released. It explains the relaxation that we feel. And once again, it's similar to tragedies. But it doesn't explain why we laugh at some things and not others. So why would we laugh at uh, a joke and not laugh at someone talking? So it's very vague, and it doesn't fully explain the limitations of humor and why we laugh at things. The superiority theory. This theory shows humor as a way to elevate one above others. So this is one of the oldest theories dating back to Plato. He saw that this theory shows, he created this theory saying that a person laughs when they feel better than someone. It puts someone above someone else. So when someone falls, they, uh, that's, that's misfortune and that's something bad about them. And so when we laugh at someone falling, we feel above them and so we have this just mental break that allows us to laugh. <coughs> So this explains blonde jokes, accidents, the general making fun of people, toilet humor, considering that that's dirty and you wouldn't want to be someone that that occurs to. But it still doesn't explain tickling, puns, knock-knock jokes, other witty humor or classic jokes, like one punchline jokes. So that leads us to our third, or fifth and final theory, the incongruity theory. So this theory is the brain's response to a surprise. So we first have to understand the brain a little bit. And so there's all these different parts of the brain. And we like to think of the brain as a supercomputer with a central government kind of that spits out information. But in reality, it's not. Uh, Simon Clems, one of uh, the leading psychologists, would state that the brain's more of an anarchy. All these parts are working with and against each other. And with that, there's a lot of confusion. So when you hear a joke, you're probably aware that a joke is about to occur. And you're able to, like, you're able to kind of guess what's going to happen next. So when someone tells you a joke, it's, um, it's kind of like, why did the chicken cross the road? So you're going to start guessing, OK. Uh, maybe, I don't know, any different thing. But what you're not guessing is to get to the other side because that's normal. That's just a regular answer. So at one point, someone probably thought that joke is funny because that just surprised him. He wasn't thinking to cross, to get to the other side. He was thinking any number of random reasons. So we anticipate the joke and the answer just surprises us. 
So this explains your kind of classic stand-up comedy. They say something, uh, something that you wouldn't necessarily think they would say, and it's funny. It explains punchline jokes, puns. You know, you wouldn't expect that someone would relate something else to another thing, and they do. And it explains tickling because you're not expecting it. That's, that's why you can't tickle yourself, according to this theory, because you're expecting it, and you, it's not funny. But it also leaves a lot of things open. We don't necessarily expect the death of a two-year-old, but we don't laugh at that. That's not something that we would consider humorous or funny. You wouldn't expect the, a bad grade if you thought you did well. You don't laugh or find being startled humorous. And a twist ending of a story, you, you probably wouldn't consider that humorous either. So there's, there's a lot of questions. Which one's right? Uh, none of these are perfect. There's no answer. We're still looking for the answer to why, why are things humorous. It's really a mix between the three of them, as I see it. The incongruity theory, the superiority theory, and the benign violation. To further my point, I uh, have a video. So SpongeBob, I'm sure everyone knows SpongeBob. And I couldn't get sound, but you can read the captions. Not as funny. But I'm sure you all have plenty of SpongeBob examples of when you laughed, jokes you know from SpongeBob. Is mayonnaise an instrument? No, Patrick. So those are not the captions. Uh, all right. I'm tapped. Uh, no, so those, those you, you can watch. You probably all know SpongeBob. So why is this funny? Is there sound the whole time? No. Get a, there we go. Why is Patrick funny? Why is SpongeBob funny? You can see that it's an example, or it's a connection of three or more. You know, things that Patrick says are random. You never know what he's going to do next as a character. And that means that he's always surprising you. But he's also very dumb. <laughs> you know, uh, well, what do you do? Blow him from stupid town? He, he does things that you would see as better or less than you. You're superior to Patrick, and you can laugh at that. But then, he also violates social norms. He, Patrick just does weird things that we usually wouldn't do. And seeing that, it's just a way for us to escape from this. So why does this matter? Humor is a part of everyday life. You probably laugh 30 times a day. So to learn more about humor is to learn more about the brain, the inner mechanisms and the workings of it, and why we laugh. <clears throat> But it's also a social aspect. You're not just laughing, and you don't just find things funny by yourself. It's with a group. But by learning more about why we laugh at certain humor, we can learn about what makes other things funny. And by, getting more, by learning more about why things are funny, we can get more of those things and expand on what we already have. Thank you. Thank you.